Welcome to Behind the Page, the Eli Marks podcast with your hosts, John Gaspard and me, Jim Cunningham. Hey there, Jim. Hey, John. How are you? I am good. For uh, listeners of the program who know that we never really talk about what year or time of year it is, I bet you can guess what time of year it is by Jim's voice. Yes, I, uh, <clears throat> I am... Uh... Uh, kind of suffering through a little bout of uh, overuse. It's not, uh, I don't think I have a cold or anything more serious than that. Uh, I, it's overuse. It's just, uh, I have uh, shouted myself hoarse for the past three weekends and I have four more to go. Well, we will uh, try to not tax you at all. This is episode 117, which means it's chapter 16. Chapter 16 is correct. God. And we have a fantastic episode because our special guest is uh, the multi-talented Mike Caveney. Boy, I'll tell you what. Yeah? Uh, it was fun to interview him. It was equally fun to listen to the interview for me. And uh, he is so knowledgeable on, I'm sure, many subjects. But this particular subject, holy mackerel, is he dialed in. Yeah. It, it, the, the problem with someone with Mike Caven is, is you just don't know. You could ask him anything. So you go, right. I can't, I can't ask him anything because I could ask him anything. But since he has written a book uh, about a song, a woman in half, and since that's a pretty popular trope in the magic world, I thought it'd be fun to take a break from something specific having to do with the ambitious card and talk to him about that. But like you said, he's, he's so multi-talented. We could have talked to him about anything, but right. as we talked to him about, when most people think of a magician, there are two tricks which come immediately to mind. What are those, Jim? I think probably uh, pulling a rabbit out of a hat mm -hmm. and sawing a woman in half or sawing a woman in any case. Yeah. Yes, because as we learn and as you will learn when you listen in, uh, gentle listener, there's actually two different tricks, uh, which we've uh, conflated in our minds as to one. There is sawing through a woman. That's trick one. And then there's cutting woman in half and separating the two halves. That's trick two. And it's a concept that goes back like 4,500 years, yeah. which is a long time. I think that doesn't it go back to like an Egyptian pharaoh? Or? As it as he will explain, yes. And it's sort of a legendary story. And uh, he uh, sort of uh, chastises magicians for not having uh, capitalized on the idea uh, until about 100 years ago that they, you know, they had 4,400 years, they could have done stuff with it. And as he'll tell us, uh, they didn't. But before we got into those questions and that discussion, I had to thank him for something he had said to me in the past, some kind of important past advice. And I just want to kick this off by thanking you. You probably do not remember this. A couple of years ago, my wife and I were at the Magic Circle when you and Tina were performing that yeah. week. Yeah, and we, we chatted afterwards. And as is often the case, Tina and Amy wandered off and were chatting and you were stuck with me for a minute. And you were asking very nicely about well, what, what is your interest in magic and what do you do? And I explained about the, the Eli Marks series and that it's very hard to see magic in Minneapolis. So any chance I got, I had to go out and see magic in order to fill the hopper for the books. And you said, well, you should, uh, while you're here, you should try to see Darren Brown. And I said, oh yeah, we, we have seen Darren Brown. And you said, well, if you get a chance, you should see The Illusionist. I said, yes, we've, we've seen that. And you listed like two other things. And I said yes to both of them. You patted me on the shoulder and said, John, you see enough magic. <laughs> and that has become sort of my mantra since then. Anytime I have a mad desire to go see something I don't need to see or buy something I don't need to buy or look at a lecture I don't really need to see, your voice in the back of my head saying, John, you see enough magic. So thank you for that. Uh, I was wrong. You never see enough. Well, now you're changing everything. I'm uh -oh. changing it up. You, you, you have to uh, double up and, and see more. You're going to bankrupt me. That's fine. <laughs> Better you than me. I suppose so. I suppose so. Well, anyway, let's get down to our business. When people think about magic, people who aren't magicians, they tend to think of two things, pulling a rabbit out of a hat and sawing a, a woman in half. Those are the yeah, two things right. that, come, that come to mind. Can you describe the trick in its simplest form for listeners? It's not as simple as it sounds. Uh, the simple version is it's a cut and restored effect. And a very old trick is a magician would take a piece of rope, cut it in half, and then restore those two halves to a solid piece of rope. That is a cut and restored effect. Everything changes when you replace that piece of rope with a human being. Because if I took a piece of rope and cut it in half and didn't restore it and threw those two pieces of rope in the trash can, nobody cares. 
go get another piece of rope. If I took a human being, cut them in half, and didn't restore them, that's murder. <laughs> Everybody cares. So it completely changes everything. And it's kind of amazing that it took so long for magicians to figure this out, that this simple change is a complete game changer. So just so you know, um, this year is considered the 100th anniversary of sawing a lady in half, based on the fact that P.T. Selwood in London, England, uh, sawed through a woman uh, for the first time in January of 1921. The, the thing that makes this amazing to me is that in 1971, 50 years ago this year, I was in college and I convinced a professor that my term paper should be on the history of sawing a lady in half. This had nothing to, I can't even remember what the class was, but it had nothing to do with whatever it was. But I think the professor was so curious, like the history of, what does that even mean? So he said, fine, do it. So now the sawing a lady in half trick at that point was 50 years old. Today, it's a hundred years old. So I have been researching this trick for half of its life, which is astonishing. But I, I just dove into this subject. And in 1971, there were lots of people for me to talk to that were involved in this trick or had seen it as far back as 1921. So I interviewed them and I kept copious notes and I saved all of that. Uh, and after I turned the term paper in, I never stopped looking for information and memorabilia and anything having to do with this trick. Mike, why do you think the trick, if it's 100 years old, has lasted as long as it has and has really been, as John said, one of the two tricks that lay people think yeah. of when they think of magic? Why has it lasted this long? Well, one of the reasons is what I said, the, the, the difference between cutting a rope in half and cutting a person in half. It's so amazing to, to have a woman lay down in a box and that see this big crosscut saw go right through her. I mean, you, people try to imagine what must it be like to be in this box having this happen. Part of the appeal to me is the sound <laughs> and the sawdust falling out and the ripping of this song. It's, it's terrifying. And another thing that people don't necessarily think about is, is that you go back to that time period and women's suffrage was the biggest thing in America and the biggest thing in England. During World War I, all the men went off to fight in the war. All the women stayed home and, and made uh, everything that the war effort needed and everything that the countries needed. Uh, and, and what they did was unbelievable. And now that the war is over, they would like equal rights. They think we've earned that. And of course, they were right. They did. And we want the right to vote. And they're marching in the streets. And, the, you know, it's a hugely contentious issue. Many people thought you should stay in the kitchen where you belong. And the women said, you know what? Without our hard work the last few years, you wouldn't have a kitchen because we wouldn't have won this war. So there was that whole thing. So with all of that going on, the idea of taking one of those women that were marching in the streets, putting in her a box and sawing that box in half. Oh, my God. The women, they couldn't even wrap their head around this. There was a woman in England who was one of the leaders of this movement, Christabel Pankhurst. And P.T. Selbit is the guy that, in, through the newspapers, would put ads in and he would say, uh, I will pay five pounds a night if Christabel Pankhurst will come to the theater so that I can saw her in half. Oh, my God. Unbelievable. And, you know, she responded, you know, in your dreams, I wouldn't submit to anything. And it was just, you couldn't buy publicity like this. So here's, some, here's another part of the answer to your question of why has this lasted so long? Well, first of all, this book starts 4,500 years ago with the West Car Papyrus. And there is described in the West Car Papyrus, a pharaoh who had a, a magician come to his palace and he took a goose and cut the goose's head off and the goose ran around and then he restored the goose to life with his head back on. So that is replacing the piece of rope with a living creature. So that's the beginning. It's not sawing a lady in half. But to take a goose and cut its head off and bring it back to life, that's great. And you almost think, why didn't some wizard the next month figure out how to do that with a person? 
Well, not only did they not, it took 4,500 years for a magician to say, hey, what if we did this? So here's what P.T. Selbit did. He put a woman in a box, but completely inside of a box. Her head didn't stick out, her feet didn't stick out, but her ankles and her wrists and her neck were tied with ropes and the ends of these ropes came out of holes in the box and spectators held these ropes tight. So in other words, she can't move an inch inside this box because they're holding on. Then he closed up the box and he, he took a saw and he sawed all the way through the box. And then they opened the box up and the lady was still in one piece. So this trick is sawing through a woman, which is very different than sawing a woman in half. We never got to see two pieces, two halves of the woman. She was in one piece, a saw went through her, and she's still in one piece. So Selbit called it sawing through a woman. It was a sensation. Of course, word of that trick spread to America, and Horace Golden, who was kind of the big illusionist at the time, heard about it. And he said, you know what? That's a good idea. Now, he didn't even know how Selbit's worked, but he said, that's, that's a trick that is going to look great on the marquee. And so he figured out his own method. And in his method, he had a box, he put a lady in it, and her head stuck out this end, and her feet stuck out this end. So nothing had to be tied in place. We could see her head and feet and hands up by her head. And he closed up the box, and he took a saw, and he sawed it in half. And then he took two little, uh, two like wooden slides and slid those into the cut and then pulled the two halves of the box apart. Here's the feet kicking over on this side. Here's the lady's head moving over on this side. So he has done more than cut through a woman. He has cut this woman into two pieces. He slid the two halves back together, opened up the box, and she was back in one piece again. So actually, two completely different tricks, sawing through a woman and sawing a woman in half. So Selbit is busy being a sensation in England. Golden's a, a sensation in America, and they're both doing these tricks. The Schubert organization, and yes, it's the Schuberts that run Broadway to this day, they decided we should have our own vaudeville uh, circuit. They had tried this years earlier. It didn't work. Uh, and they were the kings of legitimate theater, but they really didn't know anything about running a vaudeville circuit. But they were determined that in 1921, they were going to start a, a national vaudeville circuit. And they hired P.T. Selbit to bring his new trick to come to America. And that's when Golden kind of panicked and said, I have to get my trick finished and up on stage so I can stake my claim to this before Selbit arrives. And he did. He built this trick very crudely. Uh, he performed it at the SAM banquet, the Society of American Magicians in New York in June of 1921. It wasn't even sawing a lady in half. This banquet was held at the Hotel McAlpin in New York City. He got a bellboy from the hotel and put this bellboy in the box. And in front of 250 magicians, sawed this poor kid in half. The apparatus that he built was very crude, as crude as it could be, to the point where the magician saw this and said, you know what, it's so obvious how this works. You know, it's a, it's a good idea, but it's not gonna fool anybody. Well, at that banquet was Howard Thurston, and Howard Thurston and Horace Golden hated each other for various reasons. But um, Carl Rossini was there. He was friends to both of them. And he said, come on, you guys have to get together. So he dragged Thurston over to Golden and said, Come on, both you guys are great illusionists. There. You both live in the same neighborhood. You need to be friends. So they kind of spoke that night. And Thurston said, hey, I think this is a good idea. Uh, and I'd like to buy the rights from you to do this trick. And not only will I pay you money, but I'll have my shop build two new props. One for me, one for you. But they'll be 10 times better than the one that you have. So normally you would think that a magician would say, no, 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 I want to be the only guy doing this trick, which would make sense. But in those days, there was vaudeville and Horace Golden was a vaudevillian. Uh, and that means that he might do he might do 30 or 40 minutes as the headline act, but there were always five or six other acts on the bill. And he did a week here and a week here and a week here. And it was always on these vaudeville chains. And if you were booked by the Keith Albee vaudeville chain, the number one chain in America, they could keep you busy for a year, easy, hopscotching around the country, mostly in the Eastern states. And Thurston was his own show. Thurston did a two, two hour, two and a half hour show every night. And that had nothing to do with vaudeville. 
So Golden thought, as long as Thurston stays in his theaters and doesn't dip his toe into the vaudeville world where, where I exist, I think we're both okay. So he agreed. And Thurston paid him $1,000, a lot of money. And then he built these two new props and Golden started performing in vaudeville, his sewing a lady in heaven. Then Selbit arrived. Actually, it wasn't quite that easy. Golden is getting so much publicity with his new trick, the talk of the town, that the Selbit people said, you know what, bringing Selbit over here, it's, forget it, we're too late. So they wired Selbit and said, look, forget it. We're, we're, we're going to cancel this contract. This trick is, is being done because what Golden did, every theater on the Keith Albee circuit wanted Horace Golden there with his trick. Well, there was only one Golden. So the Keith Albee people said, look, could you build some more of these illusions and, and get guys and send units out? And Golden said, yes, I could. Because each week, each one of those guys would send Golden a check. And that way they could just blanket the country. The first guy he called was Harry Jansen. Harry Jansen in, a, in a, just a few years would become Dante. The second guy that he called was Servay Leroy. These are great, great magicians. And he said, look, I want you to go out under my auspices. You only have to do one trick. Instead of dragging 10 tons of stuff with you, you'll be the top of the bill. You do one trick. You'll have your name in the newspaper every day, I guarantee it. So he ended up putting out about five units of this trick, and they just went out to all corners of the country. Golden's plan was, I'm going to have ladies being sawed in half in every city before Selbit arrives there. So by the time he rolls into town, people are go, I've seen that trick. Because they, they don't know the difference between sawing through a woman and it sounds like the same thing. So that's why the Schubert people said to Selbit, forget it, don't bother to come. Now Selbit had been doing his trick in England to huge success. And he'd been doing it a lot longer than Golden had. And he had a routine which was proven. He said, look, I know I can be a success in America. So he did an amazing thing. Even though the Schubert people said the contract is canceled, Selbit said, I'm coming and I'll be here on this date in January. He came over and he said, here's what I want. I want you to put me on, just pick an afternoon when there's no show in one of your theaters in New York. I'll bring my trick in there and you can bring your Schubert executives over and I'll do my trick. And then you decide if you want to put me on one night and then put me on one of your shows in the city and let me do one performance. And now you can see it in front of a live audience. And then you can decide how much you want to pay me. Well, that's an unbelievable offer. How can you lose? So they said, okay. So Selbit comes all the way from England. I mean, this is five days on a ship, right? And he gets there and he, he comes into this theater in the afternoon and the Schubert executives get there and he, he does it and it's amazing and it's funny and it's well rehearsed. And, and they go, this is, this is completely different than Golden's. So they put him on one night. It's a sensation. They pay him $800 a week, huge amount of money. In 1921, before there was income tax, unbelievable. That's what the biggest stars in show business were getting. So now you've got Selbit on the Schubert circuit and you've got Golden on the Keith Albee circuit. And every day there's a new article in the newspaper, Selbit stole my trick, Golden stole my trick. Golden is gonna sue Selbit for stealing his trick, which is completely untrue. But all these lawsuits are being filed back and forth. At that time, they had the uh, National Vaudeville Artists, which was an organization for vaudeville performers. And they also had the Vaudeville P Protective Association, which was the Vaudeville Managers Association. And you could take a, a joke or a song or a trick or anything and register it. Before Selbit landed, Horace Golden went to the NVA, the National Vaudeville Artists, and he said, I want to register the name, sawing a lady in half, sawing a lady in two, sawing through a woman, sawing a person in half, every possible version of that trick. He registered all those names. So when Selbit arrives from England, he said, yes, I'm here to perform uh, my sawing through a woman trick. Can't do that. Can't use that. Name. What? 
okay, I'm going to do the sawing, uh, sawing a woman in half. Nope, can't use that. Okay, I'm going to do sawing a woman in two. Sorry, it's already taken. So he ended up saying, how about the great divide? And they go down the list. Yep, you can call it the great divide. So it was really backstabbing kind of stuff. So meanwhile, all the other magicians, the good magicians and the absolute bottom rung of the ladder magicians are seeing that if they build a sawing a woman in half trick and add it to their act, they will go from the bottom rung of the vaudeville ladder to headline status. All of these magicians sawing women in half. And it drives Horace Golden nuts. And he hires an army of lawyers to go after every one of these guys, drag them into court, and close them down legally. For Horace Golden, this is like playing whack-a-mole. Every time he legally closed this guy down, three more guys popped up over here, and they're sawing women in half as fast as they can. The Schubert people say to Selbit, Golden's got all these guys out there. Can you teach some magicians how to do your version? And we'll send our own you. He says, absolutely. Selbit had seven units out across America. They're bumping into each other out there all the time. You know, and the, the newspapers love it. In one newspaper, uh, a Selbit uh, act arrived the same week as the Golden Guy. And so now they're like competing theaters across the street, sawing through a woman, sawing a woman in half. And the local newspaper had reviewers go to each theater and they ran the review of each one side by side in the newspaper. So you could read what this guy did and then read what this guy did and probably say, well, I got to go see both of these to see which one's the best. It was unbelievable. By the end of the year, Selbit goes, you know what? He had tremendous success. And it's amazing because in most magic history books that you look at, it says Selbit came to America Golden had already established his trick. There was nothing Selbit could do. He turned around and sailed back to England completely defeated. Absolutely not true. The exact opposite is what happened. He came, he made $800 a week. He went from the Atlantic coast to the Pacific coast. He had all these units out getting paid from them every week. And after about three months, he said, you know what? I've kind of done what I came to do. I established my trick. Everybody saw my trick. All these guys are still doing it over here. So he said to the Schubert people, I think I'm done. I'm going to go back to England. I'll do the, a second season in England, but there's lots of other tricks that I want to invent. He went back home, did a second season throughout England in all the provincial theaters, and then did what he always did, invented new illusions. But he had learned a valuable lesson. And that is to invent an illusion where a woman is cut in half or crushed or spiked or all of these torture devices with a pretty young lady in it. And that's guaranteed success. Golden couldn't let go of the sewing. And he continued to sue people virtually for the rest of his life. Mike, you talk about, uh, in 93, you created, uh, recreated Dante Sawing a Woman in Half at the Los Angeles Conference on Magic History, but you used the original equipment. Yes. How did you get that equipment, and, and what, talk about that experience. Okay, great question, and uh, I love talking about this, because that one night, I can honestly say was one of the highlights of my entire career. I get chills just thinking about it. And I'll try to tell you why. You have to go back to 1921 when Howard Thurston said to Horace Golden, I'll give you $1,000 for the rights. And in my workshop, we'll build two new props that are beautiful and you'll have a new one. Well, the guy that Thurston hired to work in his workshop was a young Harry Jansen, who was already a great magician, he had already toured the world once with an illusion show. He had also run an illusion building company in Chicago, the Halton and Jansen Company. So he was an experienced builder and was very familiar with illusion design. And there's a lot to designing a deceptive illusion. So Harry Jansen is the one that, that built these first two really good sawing and half boxes. And then when he became Dante and he went out around the world and he performed this trick for the rest of his career, 
his long career. He lived until 1955. About three times during his career, he rebuilt this trick using all of the new technology or the new subtleties that he had figured out. And each version was better and better. And the third version that he built, I would say, was an absolute masterpiece of deception and construction. When Dante retired, he bought a ranch in Southern California where I live. Uh, I never knew him because he died when I was just a little tiny kid, but his son, Al Jansen, still lived at the ranch when I was a teenager. And Dante's show was still stored out there. A person that I knew who actually lived very near to me, and I was actually at his house, he's long gone, his name was John Daniel, a wonderful, wonderful illusionist. And John, who was cons uh, quite a bit older than me, he was very good friends with Al Jansen, Dante's son. And John bought all kinds of stuff, photographs and things from Al, from Dante's career, including that third Sawing a Lady in Half box. And one day he said, you should, you want to buy this? And I said, yes, I do. And so I bought this Dante prop, brought it home, put it in my basement. Now, back way back, like in the 1930s, when Dante was touring Australia, he needed a new assistant, and he remembered a, a girl in a show that was across the street from his show. She was a dancer, and her name was Moyo Miller. And he said, how would you like to go with the, my magic show? And she said, yes. Well, Moyo Miller didn't just become his assistant. She became his co-star. And in every poster of the day, there was a picture of Dante and a picture of Moyo. And she then toured the world with Dante right up till the end of his career. She estimated, I think it was, she had been sawn in half 11,800 times. I don't know who was keeping score, but Moyo always told me that because I knew Moyo, a wonderful, wonderful lady. And when you hear about people saying this person has the it factor or this person, you know, walks into a room and lights up the room. I haven't known many people like that, but Moyo was one of them. And her husband, amazingly, Arturo Montes, was also an assistant on the Dante show. Arturo was the one who largely built this Song of Lady in Half illusion that I now own. So when they came over once to visit, we went down in the basement to, and I wanted them to see it. They hadn't seen this trick in decades. Moyo was in her late 70s at this point. And I can't believe I said this, but I did. And I said, Moyo, do you think you could still do this trick? But before I could say anything else, she kicked her shoes off. She hopped up on this table, crawled into the box, laid down, and she said, yeah, I don't think it would be a problem. I said, okay, here's what's going to happen. I said, we do a magic history conference every other year. At the next one, I want to saw you in half in the old box that you used to do it in with Dante. And I want Arturo to be on the other end of the saw. They thought this was a great idea. So at that year's conference, I did a little talk about the history of the sawing trick and said, and now we've got a little treat for everybody. And the curtain opened and there's Dante's beautiful prop on the stage. Now, again, for this conference is, is for magic historians. They, everybody in this audience, they know the story of Dante. They know the basic history of sawing a lady in half. And they know that Moyo Miller is a rock star in the magic world. And when Moyo walked out on the stage, basically Arturo and I became invisible because here is this iridescent lady recreating this role that she had done 11,800 times. And Arturo and I sawed her in half and it was, it was thrilling. And here's the interesting thing. I love this story. David Copperfield used to come to my house and he would see this prop. And he would say, you got to sell me this prop. And I said, Dave, you're not buying this prop. It's come on, come on, come on. You got to sell me this prop. And I used to say, David, you don't have enough money to buy this prop. That drove him crazy because he has enough money to buy anything on earth. I said, you have enough money to buy anything on earth except this trick. And it drove him nuts. And then I sawed Moyo in half. And I thought, what am I going to ever do with this prop that tops that night? It's impossible. I have gone to the top of the mountain with this thing. And I, I, I called David and said, hey, you want this trick? You can't buy it, but you can trade me for it. So we did a great trade. And now that Dante sawing a lady in half 
has a prominent place in David's museum. And it looks, instead of sitting in my basement where nobody sees it, it looks fantastic in his museum. Right next to it is Moyo's costume that she wore doing this trick. And it, it's, in, it's in the right place, so. As, as you've researched this over the years, is there a, a variation on the illusion that you think is your favorite or is there one that you think was just the craziest take yeah. on it that you've seen? So your first question was, why has this trick managed to last 100 years? And I think one of the very good answers to that is it continually gets reinvented. There's always a new version of this trick. Some of them are the most harebrained ideas you've ever heard in your life, and other ones are unbelievably clever. Back in the 20s, when all these lawsuits were going on, what the newspapers love to do when they're reporting on these lawsuits is explain how Horace Golden's trick worked. So while Golden's trying to stop this guy, one guy from performing it, the newspapers just told a million people exactly how it worked. You, at some point, you would wonder, is there anybody left in America that doesn't know the secret to this trick, even if they've never seen it perform? You open up a magazine, you open up the newspaper, and in your face are some little line drawings that show exactly how it works. So as those exposures continued, and, and I'll name one in particular, this happened in 1933, the Reynolds Tobacco Company, the Camel Cigarettes, their big product, was like in second place behind Lucky Strikes. They said, we got to do something. We got to do something to promote our camel cigarettes. And some genius said, we'll make comic strips like kids read in the Sunday paper and we'll expose magic tricks. And each week we'll expose a new trick and say, and don't forget camel cigarettes are the cigarettes you should be smoking. Huge advertising campaign. Every magazine you could think of had a full page full color ad with beautiful artwork. I mean, collectible artwork. And of course, one week they exposed Sawing a Lady in Half. Horace Golden went crazy. Millions of people read this. So it's a, it's a huge, huge deal. So what magicians did was they kept inventing this trick. And one of the tricks, which every magician, if you were to ask today, who invented the buzzsaw illusion, and as you know, the buzzsaw illusion, there is no box. The lady lays on a table. We see her laying on a tabletop and a huge spinning circular saw blade cuts right through the middle of her. I mean, there's like no apparatus. There's nothing hidden. It's in your face. There's the lady, there's the blade. It cuts right through her. But this gave absolutely new legs to the old sawing a lady trick. Horace Goldman would say, I know you've seen the old version. And I know you've been told there's tricky things going on inside that box, and, uh, but come see my new show and you might be surprised. People will come and here's this lady visibly getting cut in half with a buzzsaw. So that, that gave this trick uh, new, new legs as well. And, and that has continued to this day. Uh, one of the last chapters in the book, and I, I finally gave up. I said, look, here are some more modern versions of this trick and each one, has something very clever, very interesting about it, but I'm not going to attempt to, to list every variation of this trick. That'll be for the next guy. But Penn and Teller came up with a new version of the trick. And as you would expect from Penn and Teller, they did the trick and then they seemingly exposed the trick because they are the bad boys of magic. And the audience goes, oh, that's how it works. Oh, that's clever. I know how. And then... They made a mistake, something apparently went wrong, and this buzzsaw blade dropped two feet, sawed right through this woman, blood everywhere, and all of a sudden you realize, we've been bled down the garden path and they just turned the hose on us. We have no idea how this trick works. And it's just as great in their hands as it was 100 years ago. So I think that the real answer is magicians are constantly trying to reinvent this trick. Yes, reinvention is a important part of making tricks uh, more accessible throughout the ages. But but Jim, I know you kind of, uh, in re-listening to the interview, have uh, a regret. 
I do have a regret. As I re-listened to the interview and heard him say, no, David Copperfield, you can't buy it, but I'll trade you for it. And I made a great trade with David Copperfield. Why didn't I follow that up with, what'd you get? I would have, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I, as I was listening to the interview, I said, oh, I, well, oh, dang it. Why didn't I say, what did you get out of that extensive, amazing museum collection of Copperfields? What did you get? Yeah, he may not have wanted to talk about it. So it may be good that we didn't, you know, press him on it. But off the record, I should have asked that question. And if we talk to him again, on the record, off the record, I'm going to ask that question. So I got anyway, it. that's uh, that's a question for Mike Caveney next time. If you're interested in his book, uh, it's called 100 Years of Sawing, The Astonishing History of Magic's Most Iconic Illusion. You can go to Mike's website and find it there, along with a lot of other fascinating books. The, the, the thing about Caveney is that he reminds us of uh, a Eugene Berger quote that I just overuse, which is there are many rooms in the House of Magic. And although Caveney is in many of the rooms, one of the rooms he's in is the, the love of magic history, uh, which is evidenced by his books and his working on the Magic History Conference. That I just think is something people forget that when someone says, oh, I love magic, you assume that they love performing magic. Right. When in fact, they might love the ephemera, they might love the history, all kinds of different things they can love. And it's it always a mistake when someone goes, oh, I know you love magic. I bought you this book on how to do something. It's like, well, maybe they don't want to do magic. Yeah. And that's, I think, the brilliance of Eugene is allowing people the room to be a magic enthusiast without necessarily being a performer, either professionally or semi-professionally or amateur performer of magic you can still love it and collect it and which is essentially what i do i mean i only know a few tricks that i do but i love it I, you know i absolutely i seek it out i look for it i try to watch it i uh, collect cups and ball sets so and eugene gave permission to me to just be a magic enthusiast and never worry necessarily about you know, you got to, if you want to be a magician, you got to perform that. That was a, an incredibly generous thing. I think he mm -hmm. did for magic is to say, we, you know what, you can be a part of this at whatever level you want to be at. And yes, we'll you. exactly. Uh, anyway, getting back to song woman in half, if you check the uh, show notes, we've got a link to, to an actual video of Dante sawing a woman in half. Uh, I also threw in uh, a link of the mass magician doing the trick, uh, his version of it and revealing his version of it. I know, I know. We're going to have a, a whole lot more to say about the mass magician next season when we dive into the second book in the series, The Bullet Catch. In fact, we're already lining up some great guests to help tackle the various issues raised in the bullet catch, uh, including our friend Steve Cohen, who's performed the trick, was injured in the process. Uh, who else have we got going there? Uh, Stan Allen certainly uh, is going to weigh in on uh, the mass magician and what yep. that is and what it was and yep. what it meant to magic and what it still means to magic. So. Yeah, he was in the thick of that. Anyway, we're getting ahead of ourselves. That's next really season. Are. Why are we talking about that? We really should be talking about uh, the ambitious card. Uh, we're going to listen to you read chapter 16. But first, let's quickly recap where we're at. In 15, Eli's in the hospital. Uh, after being conked in the head, he has a nice chat with Dr. Levine. Uh, he's interrogated and released, and uh, Nova shows up at the station just as Eli's leaving. And that takes us right into chapter 16. The Ambitious Card and Eli Marks Mystery. Chapter 16. I'd gotten home from the police station, walking the several blocks to the Carlisle parking ramp to retrieve my car. I drove home via side streets, my head still feeling a bit woozy, either from the crack on the head the night before or from the hospital breakfast I'd been forced to eat that morning. After giving Harry an abbreviated report on the events of the previous day and night and that morning, we both agreed that he could manage the shop while I went up to my apartment to lie down, which I did with a vengeance, sleeping for what I guessed to be several hours. At some point while I was sleeping, I heard a persistent knocking. The sound of someone knocking on my apartment door is a very rare occurrence. 
In the months since I moved back in, I don't think it had happened even once. When I was younger, in my teen years, Aunt Alice and Uncle Harry got in the habit of simply calling me on the phone when my presence was required. Neither one wanted to scale the steep stairs to the third floor, stairs even steeper and more treacherous than those they used to go up and down into the shop from their rooms on the second floor. At first, I thought the knocking was part of a dream. In my dream, I was still following Boone driving slowly behind him as he navigated the twisty streets of Prospect Park. I heard knocking and assumed there was a problem with the car. But even after I pulled the car over and opened the hood, the knocking persisted. Then something pulled me out of the dream and back to the surface of reality, and I woke up. The knocking continued, and it took another long moment for me to realize that someone was at my apartment door. I stumbled to the door, not fully cognizant of the fact that I was only wearing boxer shorts and a T-shirt. I swung the door open, fully expecting to see Harry, and instead came face to face with a large gift basket. Wrapped around the basket was a wide red ribbon. I come bearing gifts, a muffled female voice said from behind the basket. Are you in any condition to have visitors? Megan's face peeked out from behind the bountiful basket, and her eyes widened playfully when she glimpsed my attire. Perhaps I should come back later, she suggested. I woke up, fully and completely, in an instant. No, no, I said as I turned toward my bedroom. Just give me a second. I scampered, yes, that's right, scampered into the bedroom, reappearing a few moments later in jeans and a cleaner, t-shirt. To what do I owe this surprise visit? Megan was already in the apartment and had placed the large basket on the kitchen table. I stepped around her and shut the door, wondering for a moment if it was more circumspect to leave it slightly ajar. I decided that dorm rules didn't apply after age 30 and closed the door. I heard about Ariana this morning and got very upset, Megan said as she straightened the ribbon that surrounded the basket. So I walked over to your shop to talk to you. Harry explained that you were in the hospital, and so I got this basket together, but by the time I was ready to deliver it to the hospital, he said you were already home. He told me I could come up, she added. There was an awkward silence as we stared at each other, and then Megan redirected our attention toward the basket. Anyway, these are just a few things to help you recuperate, although you seem to be doing just fine. How's your head? I gingerly touched the bump on the back of my head. Still sore, but getting better. I looked at the basket, which was filled to overflowing with various and sundry items. This looks amazing. Well, it's a mix of useful items along with some other, I don't know, more playful things. She began to unload the basket. First, we have some chicken matzo ball soup from Cecil's Deli. Powerful stuff, good for what ails ya. She handed me a quart-sized plastic container, which was still warm. I held it between my hands for a few moments, enjoying the warmth and letting the aroma waft around me, and then set it on the counter. Just as powerful, she said, as she dug into the basket further, is chocolate. Never underestimate the power of chocolate. She handed me two small wrapped boxes. I didn't know if you were a dark chocolate guy or a milk chocolate guy, so I got you both, she added. Personally, I don't have any preference, so I'll be happy to eat any you don't like. I set the chocolate on the table and watched with interest as she continued to empty the basket. She was having fun, and that made it even more fun to watch. In case you get bored while recuperating, I got you a book, but not just any book, my favorite book. She held up a hardcover book. Funniest book you'll ever read, Ian Fraser's Coyote vs. Acme. Funny, funny stuff. I held up my hand in a a just-a-minute gesture, and she stopped talking, holding the book in midair. One of the benefits of living in a small apartment is that you don't have to go far to find something. I took two steps, which moved me out of the kitchen and into the living room. I reached up to a shelf on one of the two bookcases that line one wall of the living room 
and pulled out a book identical to the one she was holding, except that the cover was more frayed and worn. Megan gave a small yelp of joy. You've already got it. Yes. Well, now you have two. She handed me the book, but this one's inscribed. I started to open the front cover, but she put her hand on top of mine to stop me. Not now. Wait till I'm gone, otherwise I'll get embarrassed. She returned to the basket, and I gently set the book on the table, my curiosity now completely piqued. Back to foodstuffs. Chicken soup is vitally important while you're sick, but for me, the real cure can be found in sugared cereals. The next items out of the basket were six small boxes of sugared cereals, all held together under one cellophane wrapper. Each box says that it's one serving size, but I think we both know that all six boxes equal one serving. She handed me the cereals, and I turned the package over in my hands, seeing several favorites and feeling the pull of their sugary siren song. She stopped digging for a second and turned to give me a serious look. Eli, you may not agree with this, but I thought you needed a stuffed animal of some kind, she said, as the stuffed animal offers a unique level of comfort that may be missing in the life of someone who lives alone. I'm speaking from my current personal experience. However, you are a very manly man, so the choice of stuffed animal was particularly important. With that in mind, I believe I have made the correct selection. From the basket, she pulled a small, stuffed version of the cartoon Tasmanian Devil. He looks quite fierce, she said, as she ceremoniously handed it to me. But in reality, he's quite soft. I tested him out for you. I stood there, holding my stuffed Tasmanian Devil in one hand and the boxes of sugared cereal in the other, feeling better than I had in days, perhaps even years. My headache was gone, and the sore spot on my head was at that moment hardly noticeable. Megan continued to pull items out of the basket. I also raided my store for a few select items. She placed the objects on the table as she described them. A get-well card, handmade and hand-painted by a local artist with way too much time on her hands. She makes her own ink, for example, and I think the paper is homemade as well. I wouldn't be surprised if she grew the trees and mashed her own pulp. I picked up the envelope, which had the rough, primitive feel of homemade paper. Megan had written Eli in big, broad letters across the front. I set it down on top of the book. I also brought some candles and essential oils. The idea is you put the oils around the wick and they burn as the candle burns. Each one has a different property and is designed for a different intended effect, like harmony, balance, serenity, and so on. I color-coded everything to make it easier for you. Oils with the red dots go on the candles with the red dots. Blue goes on blue, yellow goes on yellow. You should be able to figure it out with no problem. It's like Garanimals for the New Age sect, I suggested, as I set down the cereal and the Tasmanian devil and picked up two of the candles. I gave them each a quick sniff. Unlike the odor that permeated Ariana's shop, these actually smelled quite pleasant. Megan again stopped unloading the basket and looked up at me with a wicked grin. Hey, you might be onto something there. Could be a million dollar idea. She winked at me and then reached into the basket and reverently withdrew a small purple velvet bag. A braided gold cord was used to secure the bag around the top. She undid the cord and released the contents into her hand, then held them up for my inspection. I've saved the best for last, she said. Her hand held four stones, crystals, I guessed. Megan gazed at them with wonder, but to be honest, all I saw were four small rocks. However, I did my best to look sufficiently awestruck. What do we have here? I asked. I brought you some exquisite crystals, 
Megan answered, practically cooing at the stones as if she were holding a handful of tiny, adorable kittens. They all emit a different kind of energy, working on singular vibrational levels. Each one will vibrate with your aura in a different manner. For example, this blue one, she said, picking it up and holding it gingerly with two fingers, is specifically attuned for healing. She gently handed it to me. So what do I need to do? I asked as I rolled it around on my fingertips like I would a coin during my magic act. Nothing really, she said. Crystals are natural forms of energy. You just need proximity. You can carry them in your pocket, put them by your bedside, wear them as jewelry, I offered. She shook her head. Maybe, but sometimes surrounding them with metal can have a negative impact on their intensity. Kind of like how when you put kryptonite in a lead container, it no longer has any power over Superman? She laughed. Exactly the same principle. She picked up another stone and placed it in my hand. The gesture was surprisingly intimate and, well, erotic. This is a black crystal, she said, looking up to meet my eyes. It provides protection. Great. Where was it last night when I was getting clonked on the head? She laughed, quieter this time, and picked up the third stone. This is a gold crystal, which increases wisdom. Yet another item that would have come in handy yesterday, I said, as I took the crystal from her. Our fingers touched for much longer than was necessary for the exchange. She picked up the final stone from her palm and held it up. And this is my favorite, the red crystal. It provides power with a particular emphasis on one type of energy. What type would that be? I asked noticing that she was moving closer toward me. Sexual energy, she said, and before the last syllable had left her lips, she was pressing those very same lips against mine. Our positioning was a little awkward with the kitchen table between us, but we managed to get around it without disengaging, and before I knew it, we were as one, standing there in my tiny kitchen, arms wrapped around each other, trying to find just the right placement of our various limbs. Hold me closer, she whispered during a brief break for breathing. I couldn't help myself and quoted Groucho Marx. If I were any closer, I said, I'd be behind you. As funny as that may have been, the only reaction it produced was a longer and even more passionate kiss. And then, just as quickly as it had started, she stepped back, pushing herself away from me. She ran a quick hand through her hair and straightened her blouse. I'm sorry, she said, not quite looking me in the eye. I probably shouldn't have done that. Well, I said, taking a step toward her, if you hadn't, I would have. She held up her hand. No, no, it's too soon. This is too fast. I'm confused. I took a half step toward her, and she countered with a full step backward. She was almost to the door. I'm sorry, Eli, she said again. I think you're great. Really, I do. It's me. I'm a mess. I'm... She didn't even finish the sentence. Just yanked open the door and raced through the doorway. By the time I got to the door frame, she had made surprising progress down the stairs. She rounded the corner two flights below and vanished into the magic shop which struck me as ironic for about half a second. I stood there for a long moment before I slowly shut my door. The apartment, which had always seemed small, now felt even more undersized. The sudden mix of emotions that had raced through my system in the last three minutes from instant elation to instant rejection gave me a sick feeling in the pit of my stomach. I realized that I hadn't eaten anything since that morning, and I wasn't even entirely clear how long ago that was. I saw the container of chicken soup on the counter and then shifted my gaze over the two boxes of chocolate on the table, vacillating between the options. Healthy food versus a quick shot of pleasure-inducing sugar. And then I saw the book she had left for me. Masochist that I am, I immediately picked it up and flipped to her inscription. 
In a flowery hand in blue ink she had written, Eli, hope this book makes you smile as much as you make me smile. Megan. Under her signature were a small line of blue X's and O's, which, if my junior high vocabulary was working properly, indicated kisses and hugs. Figuring if I was going to feel bad, I might as well push it to the limit. I opened the Get Well card, tearing open the handmade envelope with ferocity. The card had a watercolor image of some kind on the front, a splash of yellow that might have been a sunflower or a sunset or just a splash of yellow. I opened the card and read what she had written, hoping that the enclosed gifts help heal what ails you, Megan. This was also followed by a row of X's and O's. I was in the midst of setting the card back on the table when I heard a feeble knock at the door. I figured it was Harry, making a rare trek up the stairs to learn what I had done to inspire my guest to depart the premises with such speed. I opened the door without enthusiasm, prepared to block his questions with whatever evasions I could muster on the spot. Before I could get the door even a third of the way open, Megan pushed her way back in, slamming the door behind her. She grabbed the back of my neck and pulled me toward her, and we started up exactly where we had left off moments ago. It was as if she had never left, except now we were standing by the door. She broke away for a moment, leaning back against the door and surveying me as she took her hand and ran it through her hair. Sorry about that. I had to plug my meter, she said, a little out of breath. There are no meters on this street, I countered, as we returned to kissing with the intensity of teenagers. As I mentioned earlier, it's only a few steps from the kitchen to the living room, and from there, only a few additional steps to the bedroom. We made the trip in a record number of steps, not that I was counting. A short while later, wait, strike that, a reasonable amount of time later, by which I mean a respectable amount of time, nothing too brief and embarrassing, and yet nothing that drifted into the tantric, we found ourselves wrapped around each other, fitting quite nicely, thank you, within the confines of a twin bed that I'd called my own since about age 12. A warm yellow light dusted the room, courtesy of the street lamp below my window, and the marquee on the front of the movie theater next door. Megan played absently with the few sad hairs that called my chest their home. I looked from her to the red crystal that she had grabbed on our way into the bedroom. I picked it up off the nightstand and rolled it around my fingertips, enjoying the hard, smooth surface and watching as it picked up the dim light in the room. Well, I said, holding the crystal up for her benefit. I think it's safe to say that this one works. I'll put a little inspected by number 24 sticker on it and we can try the next one. Sorry to say I only brought the one, she said, but I have a feeling that this one will continue to work as the night progresses. She took the stone from me and ran it slowly and seductively across my chest. So... Am I your first? She asked as she peered up at me. I wasn't sure how to respond, and the look on her face was giving me no help at all. And then she burst out laughing. My first what? I asked as I laughed with her. My first psychic? My first landlady? My first divorcee? Actually, she said, her voice turned a bit serious. I'm not yet a divorcee. I'm still technically a married woman. Well, then, you are my first married woman, I said, with the exception of my first wife, but I don't think that counts. She laid her head back on my chest. It's so sad, she said quietly. What's sad? Divorce. Any divorce. Mostly my divorce, she sighed. I saw Pete the other day, brought him the divorce papers to sign. He was all set to sign them, and then he just started crying. I felt so bad for him. I ran my hand across her back in what I hoped would be perceived as a sympathetic move. 
So I said we could wait a bit, she continued more softly. She turned back and looked at me again. But as I think my actions tonight have indicated, I, for one, have moved on. At some point, he's going to have to do the same. It's hard, I said. I've been in his position, sort of. I'm sure it's difficult to be the one who leaves, but believe me, it's no picnic being the one who's left. She sighed again, and we lay there in silence. Pete and I started out so well. I just hope we can come out of this as friends. Do you get along with your ex-wife? We've reached something of a friendly impasse. Basically, I try not to make fun of her husband, and she tries to keep me out of jail. I took the crystal from Megan and set it on the nightstand. Currently, we're each experiencing difficulty in our assigned tasks. I leaned in to kiss her, but she was still looking at the nightstand. Her gaze moved from there to scan the entire room. This is almost exactly as I pictured it, she said. You fantasized about my bedroom? No. Well, yes. I mean, I just sort of wondered what it would look like. Well, as the landlord, I believe you have the right to enter at any time for an impromptu inspection. I may have to exercise that right on a more consistent basis, she said. She reached over to the nightstand, and I thought she was bringing the crystal back, so was surprised to see that she had grabbed the deck of cards that was lying there. You play a lot of cards in here, she asked, like... Solitaire, she added with a wicked smile. Magicians always have a deck of cards within reach, I said. It comes with the territory. I mean, I'm willing to bet you have quite a few crystals scattered about willy-nilly at your place. Willy-nilly, she repeated, raising an eyebrow. Well, yes, but those are for mystical, not practical reasons. Whoa, full stop. Let's not underestimate the mystical qualities of a standard deck of cards, I said, taking the deck from her and doing a quick fan of all the cards. The mystical qualities of a deck of cards, she said with a note of doubt in her voice, such as... I squared the deck and then did a series of one-handed cuts while I spoke. Well, you might be surprised just how interesting an average deck of cards actually is. There's a lot going on in here, I said. Such as, she asked. Such as, I said, mentally scrambling to remember all the arcane facts I knew about playing cards. There are two colors, red and black, representing day and night. Okay, Megan said, sounding completely unconvinced. There are four suits, each representing one of the four seasons. There are 52 cards in the deck, just as there are 52 weeks in the year, she suggested. Exactly. I pulled the top card off the deck, extended my arm, and made the card first disappear from my hand, and then made it reappear a moment later. Each suit consists of 13 cards, which corresponds to the 13 lunar cycles in a year. And finally, I said, Returning the card to the deck and squaring it again, if you add up all the values of the cards, you'll get 364. Add one more for the joker, and you end up with 365, or the number of days in one year. As I finished my recitation, I made one single card, the joker, rise up out of the deck as a final flourish. Megan laughed and applauded. Well, that's all well and good, she said, taking the deck from me and returning it to the nightstand. But what sort of vibrational energies do the cards emit? Nothing like the red crystal, I admitted. So it's a good thing you brought it along. We started kissing again, and I'd venture to say that we both forgot entirely about the cards and the crystals for the next few minutes. <laughs> So that's chapter 16, and you sounded in much better voice reading that than you do now, which makes yeah. me suspect that you've already recorded all the chapters. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, when you butt it up against what I've got right now, you can hear that I might not be 
at my absolute best vocally oh. vocally no. Anyway, that was chapter 16. That has, I believe, the only quasi-sex scene in the series, and it is pretty tame by just about anyone's standards, but that's the only time that's going to happen. So anybody who uh, eyebrows were raised at that, you can put your eyebrows back down. It's not going to happen again. (laughs) Hey, uh, we just got to give a big shout out to Mike Caveney. What a fantastic guest uh, he was on this episode just so enjoyable so knowledgeable so funny uh, yeah. has so what a great story uh, he told about owning the prop and finding the original woman and gosh i just uh, you, i can't get enough of it now yeah, he's a fantastic performer we put a link to him doing uh his linking coat hangers in the uh in the show notes it was something we were scheduled to talk to him about uh, during that interview, but we just ran out of time. But it is something I want to revisit with him because he took a uh, classic of magic, which is a sort of puzzling trick because it's the sort of thing where it's a, it's props that only magicians have right. and why are they doing it? And he turned it into coat hangers and everybody's had coat hangers tangle up and it's a, just a brilliant routine. So check out, check and that out. Check out all the show notes because there's good stuff. But we got so many great guests coming up. Uh, David K, a.k.a. Silly Billy. Uh, Tina Leonard is coming up. One of my absolute, I just can't, I wish I could see him three times a week. John Carney, uh, who else is coming? Uh, we've got Steve Spill, uh, Rob Zabrecki and Morgan and West are going to stop back in toward the end of our season. And then we have a very special surprise guest for the final episode of season one. Who is it? Uh, you'll have to you'll have to tune in for that. Oh. But next episode, we are thrilled to be chatting with Carissa Hendricks, uh, aka Lucy Darling, about uh, creating that and other compelling characters and how she makes that work. And if you don't know Lucy Darling, we'll have some clips of her in the show notes uh, next time. But she is just an amazing performer. And then, as we also mentioned, we're gearing up for season two, where we're going to chat with, as Jim mentioned, Stan Allen. We're going to talk to Jonathan Levitt, David Parr. Uh, David Regal and Steve Cohen will be back. Uh, we've got Ryan Kane on deck, Harrison Greenbaum. It, it just goes on and on and on. Yeah. So listen, don't miss an episode, folks. Subscribe and then rate us on your preferred podcast platform. That's really, you'd be doing us a huge favor. It really helps us if you do that. It really does and helps other people find us. In fact, they tell me that uh, if you review it on the Apple podcast site, uh, that has the biggest impact for some reason. And reviewing can mean just as much just hitting the rating button and hit four or five on the rating. Uh, you don't have to do anything more than that, but that somehow triggers the algorithm and it, it offers the podcast to other people. So anyway, as Jim said, be sure to check out the links in the show notes for all the great clips we have there. And other than that, uh, Jim, you go have some nice tea. Take care of that voice. Yep. I got some honey and some tea and I'm going to sit quietly. All right. That'll be great. We'll see everybody next time. Bye-bye. Take care. This has been Behind the Page, the Eli Marks podcast with your hosts, John Gaspard and Jim Cunningham, produced by Albert's Bridge Books at Grass Lake Studios. Find this podcast and all the books in the Eli Marks series at elimarksmysteries.com. That's E-L-I-M-A-R-K-S, mysteries.com. And thanks for listening. Thank you.